1978, when this song came out, America was in need of a little hope and a little unity. Our country had been through some tough times and needed something different. Let me explain. In 1978, Jimmy Carter was president, and the Pittsburgh Steelers were on their way to winning their third Super Bowl. The Commodores song, Three Times a Lady, was on the charts. I need y'all's help. You're once, twice, three times a lady, and I love you. Come on, y'all supposed to do that part. <clears throat> and my favorite movies were Grease and Close Encounters of the Third Kind. So when One Nation Under a Groove came out, I knew that this song was different. It was a new kind of sound. It was direct and conflicted, yet it was fun and sincere. It was uh, disorganized, irreverent, and maybe a little bit sexy. Yeah, it was definitely sexy. <laughs> this was P-Funk, a new era of the funk. And as a teenager in this point, in my life, what I did not understand was that this song was released on the tail end of a very dramatic period in American life. You see, just 14 years earlier, America had just begun to dissemble legalized segregation with the passage of the 1964 civil rights legislation. Just 10 years earlier, in 1968, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated at a motel just down the road in Memphis, Tennessee. We'd experience the impeachment of a president, and at long last, the end of the Vietnam War. So what I, what I had to wrestle with then, and what I had to come to understand was that this song was a very important one for our country at that time. This was what it was like to be a kid in 1978. And so Parliament Funkadelic, when they released this song, it really literally gave instructions to Americans that we could, in fact, be one nation under a groove, getting down just for the funk of it. One nation, we're on the move. Nothing can stop us now. Now, I know, I know, when we think of anthem, we typically think of songs like America the Beautiful or the Star Spangled Banner. Or maybe, depending upon where your loyalties lie, maybe you think a little bit about Rocky Top. <laughs> but these songs, these anthems, in fact, are songs that bring people together. They unite and inspire us. They give us a sense of identity. And what I had to come to appreciate was that these songs were, in fact, as old as the Republic, as modern as the millennial generation, and as common as the fight for justice and equality. These songs that give us courage, articulate our purpose, and maybe even spur us forward are as American as baseball, and apple pie. You know, if we're candid, we can acknowledge that slavery is America's original sin. And maybe one, just one, of its most defining moments. Because slavery was not just about physical bondage, but slavery was about limiting access limiting access to economic resources and limiting access to political representation, which have palpable effects on economic and education disparities even today. But I, I suppose that's the subject of someone else's TED Talk. In my family's case, slavery was the defining moment. You see, my great-great-grandfather's name was Albert Hicks. But Albert was known as Squire in Shreveport, Louisiana, where he worked in a lumber mill. 
The squire was actually born in East Texas on the Kirby Plantation. And as the story goes, in 1863, at about the age of 11, upon the passage and ratification of the Emancipation Proclamation, Squire left the Kirby Plantation. He walked down a dusty road about 15 miles in search of a new place to settle and in search of a better life. And somewhere along the line, he stopped into a small town and he happened into the town hall. And when he got there, he looked up on the wall and he noticed that one of the town's leaders' last name was Hicks. And so there he left Kirby and he decided that his name would be Hicks. Slavery is also the defining moment for American music. So in 1739, an event occurred called the Stono River Slave Rebellion. This was the largest uprising in the British American colonies, one in which Congolese rebels used drums to communicate and to rally into battle. Now, of course, that rebellion was put down, and the enslaved were sent back to work. And then shortly thereafter, laws were passed up and down the East Coast, outlawing <clears throat> the use of the drum. So my contention is that this is really when American music was born, because this is when innovation was required, taking away their drums, taking away their instruments, did not take away their fight, did not take away their spirit, did not take away their music, and certainly didn't take away their anthems. Reinterpreting African traditions as well as newer Christian narratives, the enslaved often would create songs we now think of as spirituals that often reflected the freedom that they so desperately wanted, and the hope that sustained them. The enslaved would begin to make something out of nothing using their voices and their bodies, and then common, everyday, discarded instruments maybe that they would find around the plantation to create their own makeshift musical instruments, such as, for example, a, a wash tub turned upside down with a broom handle to create an, an upright bass, or a cigar box and a tree branch stuck together to create a guitar. Now, as these spirituals began to spread from the cotton fields and the tobacco plantations in the Deep South all across America with the Great Migration, these songs became more creative and more diverse, ranging from hymns to blues-influenced gospel. And these are the traditions of my upbringing. My great-grandfather, both of my grandfathers, my father and my brother, are all Baptist ministers. <laughs> and so it would come as no surprise to you then that a song such as Great Is Thy Faithfulness would be among our family's favorite anthem. This 1923 Old Testament-based song speaks in the final stanza of Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with 10,000 beside. Great is thy faithfulness. And I can just hear and imagine my father singing that song boldly from the pulpit and my mother somewhere in the second or third row with a big purple hat on, matching him full-throated note for full-throated note. But there are other traditions too. Jazz is simply the narrative of the African-American experience. And in this tradition as well, anthems emerged, such as Nina Simone's Mississippi God Dance, and she meant every word of it. And Billie Holiday's Strange Fruit, which was inspired by this uncomfortable picture that we're looking at now. In 1971, the R&B crooner Marvin Gaye wrote the anthem, What's Going On, in protest of police brutality in the Vietnam War. And then in 1979, McFadden and Whitehead wrote a pretty popular song.
So Ain't No Stopping Us Now became known as the new Negro National Anthem because it represented uh, the African-American experience, and that's why it's often played at family reunions all across the country, just like, like my own. This was about in 1979 when the song came out. In 1981, Michael Jackson and Lionel Richie and Quincy Jones penned the anthem, We Are the World, going on to sell more than 20 million copies this song, of course, was an anthem for African famine relief. And then, 1989, the number, another summer, sound of the funky drummer, Public Enemy, one of the most iconic hip hop groups of all time, did a remake of the Isley Brothers song. And this, of course, was a new anthem for a new generation in a new form. We got to fight the powers that be. Quite a powerful anthem, if you ask me. And then, it wasn't until 1998, when the movie, the comedic movie Rush Hour came out, that this 1970s kid was introduced to the Edwin Starr anthem, the 1969 Edwin Starr anthem. Y'all know this one, too. War, huh. good God, now, what is it good for? That's right, say it again. <laughs> That's right. And then in 2014, the movie Selma came out, featuring a song by the name of Glory, performed by John Legend and Common. I spent childhood summers in Selma, Alabama, <clears throat> where I would spend time with my great-grandmother, Ritter Steele, who lived in a shotgun house with a rusted tin roof. And I'd also spend time with my cousins there, and we'd go swimming in a segregated pool that was built just for the black kids down a dirt road. And then from time to time, my grandmother would take us downtown, and she would have to pull my brother and I to the side as hooded Klansmen walked through and acts of public intimidation. And then the song Glory reminded me of days as a young man when I lived not too far from Ferguson, Missouri, which is referenced in the song. And I could relate to Michael Brown, and I was not surprised by rioting in that city because I was often, when I lived in that area, I was often stopped by the police for suspicion of selling drugs because I drew, drove a new car. And I recall the time when driving that car, when I was pulled over by a police officer and a shotgun was put to my head because someone had shot at a police officer who was driving a Toyota several miles away. So the song Glory brings tears to my eyes, but I'm glad that the movie is really about triumph and the song both about resistance and unity. And then finally in 2016, when Kendrick Lamar performed his anthem, We Gonna Be All Right, on the Grammy stage, we were all glued to our television sets. Featuring a eclectic mix of hip hop, R&B, soul, and jazz, this song and the album on which it appears to Pimp a Butterfly was, not surprisingly, heavily influenced by Parliament Funkadelic. And Kendrick's performance of that song and the lyrics reflect a violent past and present, some state-sanctioned, and some self-inflicted. And, you know, just like the kids in the 1970s, kids today have lived through their own set of change and turmoil, challenge. Just think about it. Hurricane Katrina, a wave of mass shootings, the Great Recession, the election of the first black president. And my youngest son, Harrison, was born on 9-11, just as the planes were flying into the towers, one of America's most tragic and memorable moments in, in modern American history. And so the pattern continues. 
We're going to be all right is yet another anthem for another generation in another form. And so you can imagine that this notion of one nation under a groove means as much to me today as it did in 1978. And I hope that the images that shape my children's upbringing give them a sense that they can hope for a better life, that they can expect a better future, that they might have to fight, but hopefully not have shotguns put to their head to achieve those aims. But now I'm curious. I'm curious because I want to know what their anthem might be. I want to know what the soundtrack of their lives will be. And going even further, I'm curious about your soundtrack. I'm curious about the anthems and the songs that mean so much to you and to your family. What is your anthem? Because at times like these, times that we're living through right now, times when trust in government is at an all-time low, times when compromise in the legislature seems to be a dirty word, when school boards have forgotten that they're working for the children. Maybe it's time for a little hope and a little unity. Maybe we need some compromise. Maybe we need a little vision. Maybe we need some teamwork. And we certainly need to be reminded more than ever that we are one nation under a group. Yeah.